thank you. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, and thank you everybody watching online. Uh, thanks to B&H for having me here again. Um, it's probably my favorite place to talk, so it's good to be back. Uh, so my name is Chris Nicholson. Uh, I'm the author of Photographing National Parks, which has very little to do with what we're talking about today, except that most of the photos you're going to see were shot in national parks. Um, I do have copies of my book here if you're interested uh, afterward, and the website for that is photographingnationalparks.com. I'm also uh, a partner and instructor with National Parks at Night. We do night photography workshops in the national parks and in similar places. Uh, these are all the places that we're going uh, in 2018. We just finished up our 2017 itinerary in eastern Sierra. Um, which we have somebody who flew straight here from that workshop to be with us today. Uh, so uh, happy to take questions about that afterward. Um, uh, but obviously one of the things that we do when we're out shooting in the parks at night is night skies. I mean, that's a huge component of it. And it's one of the first questions we get about you know shooting the Milky Way and shooting stars and um, shooting star trails. Uh, so that's what we're going to cover today. Stars and star trails uh, primarily and uh, touching on all the different things that go into capturing great photos of the night sky. So first things first is essential gear. Uh, there are some things that we need to do this. A tripod is essential. You have to shoot with a tripod. Um, you also need a head. Uh, I use the the, a Gitzo head on a, uh, on a Gitzo 3543 LS tripod. Uh, you'll notice one thing about the tripod that I use. It doesn't have a center column. And the reason is I never use a center column because as soon as you raise that center column a couple inches, it changes the stability of that tripod. Um, when we're shooting at night with long exposures, we want that tripod to be as stable as possible. So because I never raise the center column, because I never use it, I was able to save $100 on the cost and save a little bit of weight in what I carry around by buying one that doesn't come with the center column on it. The case relay, uh, this is made by Tether Tools. Um, if, unless you have a camera that's one of the top and flagship cameras of whatever brand you use, chances are you're gonna have a, uh, an issue with batteries if you're shooting all night, uh, particularly if you're doing very long exposures. One of the ways around this is to have a, um, oh, you can have spare batteries, of course, and keep, keep uh, you know, one or two spare batteries with you, whatever you need for your particular camera. But you can also have an external power supply. Uh, so Tether Tools has what's called the case relay, you plug it into a battery, and it will, you know, depending on your specific model of camera, it will keep you charged for up to about five times as long as normal. Now we have tried to drain the battery with the case relay and have always failed. And that's up to a six hour exposure that Gabe Biederman, one of the other instructors I work with, uh, he did six hours and still couldn't kill the battery with the, the Tether Tools battery. So uh, that's another option to consider. Also an intervalometer. At the very least, you want a remote shutter release. So the difference is a remote shutter release pretty much just on and off. You're clicking your shutter, maybe you can lock it down. Um, but also an intervalometer, uh, that goes a step further. So with an intervalometer, you can set uh, the interval between exposures. You can uh, set for really long exposures. You could, you know, you could set a 99 hour exposure if you needed to, uh, and other different things. It just gives you, it allows you to level up the kind of exposures that you can do. You want something to hold that intervalometer or that shutter release down. Uh, this is what I like. Um, this is a, an RG. It's just a, a little pocket that straps onto the tripod, and you can stick the intervalometer in there. The reason you want to do this is because you don't want that intervalometer or your shutter release waving in the wind onto the tripod. So if it's breezy and that's waving back and forth, that can move the tripod and over the course of a long exposure cause some blur, cause some motion blur in your image. Uh, you could also do a, a do-it-yourself solution. You could get uh, some Velcro, sticky Velcro, stick it on your tripod, put another piece on the back of your intervalometer and stick it on that way. Uh, one thing that I like to do is get the, uh, there's the Velcro wire ties, and that, that'll fit perfectly around a tripod leg. 
uh, and then you can just kind of stick your, the, the wire of the intervalometer, the shutter release under that Velcro and just, um, just uh, secure it down. Gloves. Uh, I actually had them in the car, so I brought them. Uh, these are Valoret photography gloves. There's different brands, but I really like these. The reason we're using these is unless you're shooting in summer, at night, even fall in the winter, at, at night it can get cold out. Um, so the Valorette photography gloves, uh, they fit really nicely and they've got the flat, flip back finger and thumb with a little piece of, uh, there's a magnet in there to hold it down. There's a little pocket in here to slide a hand warmer in. So just to stay nice and warm but still be able to use your gear. I was just wearing these um, the other night. I was shooting in the Smoky Mountains and then on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And even though it was perfectly comfortable during the day, at night it did get cold. And I was able to keep my hands warm enough to, to still be able to work well. Going to want a fast lens. 2.8, uh, I would say, would be your, your starting point. Um, an f4, a 5.6 lens is generally going to be too small of an aperture for doing your best work with night skies. Uh, that's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, if you have a camera that does really well at extremely high ISOs, that's fine. Uh, but all the cameras I've used, uh, including the Nikon D5, uh, which is my favorite for night photography, I don't want to go over 8,000 ISO. So uh, if you want to keep stars sharp, now if you're only doing star trails, it doesn't matter, but if you want to do photos with sharp stars, then you're going to want something at least 2.8, if not a 1.8, or a 1.4. If you have a camera that doesn't do well at those high ISOs, maybe you can't go over 1600 and get a satisfactory image, then it's even more important to have a lens that you know maybe can open up to 1.4. Um, another thing you want to look at with the lens, uh, if you want to get really technical, is you want to watch for coma, uh, which is just an artifact uh, up in the corners of the frames where the, the stars can appear elongated or look like they have wings. Uh, and this happens with every lens. It's just a matter of the extent that it happens. So if you're looking at different lens, lenses, that's one thing to test or do some research on is to see how much coma it has. So this is the Nikon 14 to 24, uh, which is one of the best that we've tested. Nikon has a couple of faster lenses that are tempting to get, but in order to reproduce the coma, or the lack of coma that you get with this lens, you've got to stop them down to 2.8 anyway. So may as well start with the 14 to 28, which performs really, really well wide open. I'm sorry, the 14 to 24. Which leads me to cameras. Of course, you need a camera. Uh, if you're really going to get into night photography, pick a camera that performs well at high ISOs. This is the Nikon D850, which we just started using out at our Eastern Sierra workshop. I haven't personally gotten to use one yet. But I heard from Lance and Tim, uh, Lance Kymeg and Tim Cooper, two of the other instructors, uh, thought that it, it held up really well, <laughs> that it uh, performed really well. Uh, and we're actually going to be doing a blog post about that in the coming weeks, comparing the D850 with the D750, which to this point we thought was the best camera available for night photography, and also comparing it to the D5, which is my personal favorite for night. Uh, so if you're interested in the Nikon gear in particular, check out our blog in a few weeks and uh, see what our tests show about that. Gonna need a bag to put them all in. Uh, this is the Peak Design backpack, uh, which is a really nice piece of gear. Uh, but just something to carry all this stuff out uh, into the field with. It can be tempting to kind of throw these things in your pocket. Uh, but. Uh, when you're working in the dark, if you drop something, particularly little things, a uh, flashlight, uh, a gel, a lens cap, uh, if those things fall out of your pocket, they're hard to find. So along the same lines, it's a good idea to have a headlamp. Uh, this is uh, one made by Coast, and we really like these a lot. Um, so two things about it. One is it's got a nice bright beam that's focusable. So I can focus this. So this is good for walking around and staying safe, uh, particularly when you're walking out to a location or coming back from a location in the dark, especially if you're hiking a couple miles. You want to be able to see. Um, if you're out in the wilderness, you don't want to be tripping over roots, um, things like that. But the other thing is when you're working, 
getting things in and out of your bag um, while walking around the scene when you're in the middle of shooting, you don't want to use this bright white light because that's going to ruin your night vision. Right? Your eyes get adjusted to the dark and you want them to stay adjusted to the dark. So the red light. So this won't ruin my night vision, but in a dark environment will give me plenty of light to be able to see as I rummage through my bag or have to look around on the ground, uh, again, to make sure I'm not tripping over a root or whatever. Uh, you do want to make sure with that red light not to have it on during an exposure, though. Uh, it looks to the naked eye like it's not leaking anywhere, but I guarantee you, if you stand behind your camera with this on for even just a 20-second exposure, you're going to get a red foreground. If that's what you're going for, by all means. Okay, so, night skies. The first thing to discuss is white balance. Uh, and then we're going to get into actually shooting the stars. Um, if you shoot the night skies at auto or daylight, they tend not to look right, uh, especially if you shoot them at daylight white balance and you do a really long exposure. Um, your scene could just look like daylight. Uh, so why bother shooting at 2 in the morning if it looks like you shot at 2 in the afternoon? So you want to get your white balance right. Normally, when I'm shooting a dark sky, I'm setting my white balance to tungsten or incandescent, depending on what your specific camera calls it, but it's about 3200K. Um, this is what gives the night sky in your photographs that night look, that cool toned, that, you know, that deep blue. Uh, if you're shooting the Milky Way, then you might consider bumping that up to 3900K. And the reason is, uh, even though that's going to make the sky itself a little warmer too, it's also going to draw out the warm tones that are in the Milky Way. Um, you'll, you'll find that they'll have just a little more color and a little more pop shooting at about 3900. And then if you're shooting in moonlight, bring it even cooler still. Shoot about 3000, 2800 into the 3000s. All this is ballpark. Uh, this is, you know, tungsten incandescent. It's not night sky white balance, right? So this is, these are ballpark figures. Uh, use them as a starting point and see how you like the color of the photographs that you're creating. If you want to get really into white balance, we did a uh, Matt Hill, uh, who's going to be speaking with me on light painting later today, wrote a blog post for us about this uh, a few weeks ago on um, color balance uh, and white balance and getting the color right with night, night photos. He did another post earlier this year specifically about which, um, which color temperatures to use in, in different night scenes, including urban. Okay, so star points and star trails. Um, okay, star points and star trails. We're going to start with star points. Because uh, once you know how to shoot those star trails is the next obvious step. Um, star points, of course, that's kind of freezing a moment in time, even though we're talking about a 15, 20, 30 second exposure. Uh, this looks more like we've frozen those stars. And then star trails is more about bending time and showing the passage of time. Shooting star points, nice sharp starts, uh, nice sharp stars, starts with shutter speed. That is. That's the key component in your exposure, is the shutter speed. Because if your shutter speed is too long, then the star starts to trail, because it's moving across the frame. Well, technically, we're moving, so the frame's moving across the star. But uh, from our perception, the star's moving, right? So we need to keep our shutter speed short enough so that the star doesn't move during the exposure. It doesn't appear to move during the exposure. Uh, Talking about star points versus star trails, there's this middle ground that I want you to avoid. If, if you do an exposure just a minute or two and you start to get star trails, just really short ones, it looks like an accident. Right? You generally don't want short star trails. You want either star points or longer star trails. Star trails that are, you know, how long? It, there's no magic number, but star trails that are long enough so that it's clear it wasn't an accident. So, in order to get star points, we need a shutter speed that one, provides enough light for the image to record the image, and two, freezes the motion of the stars. How do we arrive at that? That's the 400 rule. 
Um, if you've been shooting for a while, uh, you might have heard of the 500 rule, which is kind of the old 400 rule, but larger. Uh, the 500 rule was better suited to, to film. The digital sensors we're shooting with now out-resolve the film, most of the film we were shooting with. So the 400 rule is going to give you a better result. Um, the 400 rule is pretty simple. You just take 400, divide it by the focal length of your lens, and that gives you the maximum number of seconds that you can shoot before those stars start to move. So 400 divided by the focal length. Here's a couple of examples. Oh, quickly, if you have an APS-C camera, then it's the 250 rule, because uh, you get like a 1.5 crop. Uh, if you've got four thirds, it's, it's even different. But we're going to talk in 35 millimeter equivalent, which is the 400 rule. But this is good to know if you, if you have a camera with a 1.5 crop factor. Okay, so with the 400 rule, say we're shooting with, with a 16 millimeter lens. So ballpark, 400 divided by 16 is 25 seconds. So that means I could shoot a 25 second exposure and not get the stars moving. And this is an example. This is in Olympic National Park. 16 millimeter lens, 25 second exposure, and the stars are nice and sharp. 20 millimeter lens, 400 divided by 20, 20 seconds. Same thing, sharp stars. This is in Joshua Tree. 24 millimeter lens, 400 divided by 24, 16 seconds. You, you can see, as we're using a longer lens, we have less time in order to capture those stars nice and sharp. Incidentally, I shot this about 20 feet away from you. <laughs> this was up in Cape Cod. Uh, Klaus and I shot together the night after our workshop ended last spring. And by the way, I get this question a lot. This rule also works in moonlight. Okay, we hear this a lot. So, well, we can't do night photography because the moon's out. Yes, you can. Um, and it's the exact same rule. Here's an example. This is moonlight. This is a full moon coming up over the horizon, lighting the scene, but using the 400 rule, still getting some sharp stars. Now, it's not as many stars because the moon is uh, it's washing out the dimmer stars, but we still can shoot. So now that you have your shutter speed, all you have to do is determine which aperture and ISO makes that shutter speed work. That's it. It's just like figuring out an exposure in daytime, except you're starting with that shutter speed. A good starting point, the F28 at 6400. This is usually where I'm shooting. Uh, if you have a 1.4 lens, you can shoot at 1600. So this is a good starting point. Uh, but see, you know, one of the things that might affect this is light pollution in the sky. Uh, so you might need to stop down a little bit. Uh, if it's really, really dark out in Death Valley, it's a gold tier night sky as rated by the International Dark Sky Association. I actually find myself shooting at ISO 8000 out there, uh, which again, with the D5, I can do. I can really push that ISO. This is the kind of histogram that you're going for. So if you're using your histogram to check your exposure, when you're shooting a night sky, you're not going to get you know, that nice bell curve histogram that we usually get with a day photo. Why? Because there's so much dark in the frame. This is all night sky in the sea stack. That's what most of the frame is. And then this little trail, and it starts to get dotted over here. That's the Milky Way and the stars. So this is a good night histogram. So if you had this for a day photo, you'd know your exposure is probably wrong. But at nighttime, shooting the stars, this is your goal. Uh, one software option that can help you do some better night sky photos with star points is uh, Starry Landscape Stacker, which is relatively new. Uh, I haven't gotten to test it because it's Mac only, uh, but Matt Hill uh, has tested it. And uh, he's really excited about it. And everybody I know who's tried the software is excited about it. Uh, essentially what it does is uh, you can shoot multiple frames of the stars. So say you, you do your 20 second exposure, but you're at ISO 6400 and you get a little bit of noise. 
you could shoot, say, 10 frames of that. And Starry Landscape Stacker will take all 10 frames and put them together and use some dark frame subtra uh, subtraction, and it'll figure out where the noise is. You know, what are those, which dots are noise, which dots are stars. It'll mask out the noise, and it'll kind of add all those star exposures together to get really nice bright stars in the frame. Um, now, if you think about the mechanics of that, say we've got 10, 20 second exposures, <coughs> right? That could be a 200 second exposure. What happens over 200 seconds? The stars move. Right? So what the software does is it compensates for that by rotating each frame just enough so that all the stars are on top of each other. Now, if you think even further, if you have foreground material, that foreground is going to rotate too. So this is going to mess up your foreground. What you do in Starry Landscape Stacker is you tell it which frame to use for the foreground, and then when it does, it's done with all its computations, it takes that one foreground and masks it in. So you end up with a final image that has, um, you know, essentially in that example, a 200 second exposure with sharp stars and a sharp foreground. Again, this is Mac only for now. Uh, here's the website right here. You could also find it uh, on the App Store. So that's pretty much it with Star Trails. It's not that difficult. Like I said, the, the key thing is that shutter speed. That's what you want to figure out. Uh, so remember the 400 rule. And if you don't want to remember the 400 rule, you could get an app that has it built in. Uh, or I've, I've seen people do this. You can actually create a chart for the lenses that you have and figure out with each lens that you own, how fast you could shoot and still get sharp stars, and then keep it in your pocket. I've even seen somebody who laminated it and it hangs around his neck when he's out shooting. Uh, so you can keep that information with you all the time. Um, but the 400 rule is pretty simple. 400 divided by the focal length. So that's the key uh, for getting sharp stars. So star trails, I mean, this is a different matter. So now star trails, longer exposures, more time. So again, we're bending time. We're showing the passage of time. Nice sharp foreground, blurred stars, star trails. So what I'd want you to ask before you even start doing it is, do you want your image to have star points or star trails? This is a good thing to think about in the field. Um, just because you can do star trails doesn't mean you always should. Uh, you know, just because you learn a new trick or you, you've got a, a trick in the bag, you've got a tool in the tool bag, doesn't mean it's always the right tool for the job. Uh, it's kind of like when you get a fisheye lens and all of a sudden everything looks like it should be shot with a fisheye lens, right? Star trails are not always the right answer for a composition. And that's what it comes down to, is composition. Think about composition when you're deciding, even if you want to pursue during, uh, doing star trails. Some of the things I think about, uh, star points tend to be dainty. Right? So that has a different compositional effect. Whereas star trails can be a really strong presence. Here's an example. This is in Olympic National Park at Ruby Beach. I did some pretty heavy light painting here. So this C stack has a pretty significant weight, a visual weight, in the composition. However, the stars, like I said, they're, they're dainty. They're, they're, this is off balance to me. I was doing star trails here. That's more visual weight. This balance is better compositionally. So in this case, absolutely, yes, I want to do star trails. This is in Capitol Reef National Park. Now this light painting is pretty delicate. Incidentally, I didn't do this light painting. This is uh, Gabe Biederman, was a, a quarter mile away from me. I, I couldn't have called to him, we didn't have radios, but I saw him doing light painting and it was really nice, so I just waited, and stole his light painting. <laughs> um, but it's, it's delicate, right? So, here, for me, the star trails are kind of overwhelming when compared to the primary subject of the scene. 
Here, I like star points better. I think it, ba it balances better compositionally. So that's just something to think about. Um, star trails affects the composition in other ways, too. First thing to think about is the length of the star trails. Um, for any given shutter speed, different focal lengths are going to produce different lengths of star trails. So this is an eight minute exposure with an 80 millimeter lens. Same exact exposure, eight minutes, but with a 200 millimeter lens. And you can see how much longer those trails appear. Now this is just because of the way that lenses work, right? So anytime you've got a telephoto lens on, it's compressing the scene, you're shooting less, you've got a reduced angle of view, however you want to think about it. So the stars are moving exactly the same. But because it's a 200 millimeter lens, they're moving across a smaller frame, essentially. So they look like they've moved longer. So again, here they are side by side. The 80 millimeter lens, 200 millimeter lens. Also, shooting toward different compass points, that's going to produce different length star trails, again, for the same shutter speed. So this is facing north, east. You can see how they got longer. West is the same. And then south is the longest. And these are all 10 minute exposures. So here's an example. Uh, this is facing north, and this was a 20 minute exposure. And you can see how short those star trails are. This is 20 minutes, but facing west. So again, that's the same amount of time, same shutter speed, but because I'm facing a different compass line, uh, different compass direction, the star trails are longer toward the west. So here they are side by side. Same lens, same amount of time, but this is facing north and this is facing west. Now those are pretty long trails, right? So this is facing north again, but not 20 minutes. This is 80 minutes. So if I'm facing north, I generally, 40 minutes is my benchmark. I want to shoot north for at least 40 minutes to get good trails. Um, I could maybe do half an hour, but anything less than that, they're looking pretty short. There they are side by side. Facing north, a similar focal length, 20 minutes and 80 minutes. So again, you can imagine how this affects your composition, right? That's a totally different presence in the scene than this is. I also want you to think about the direction of the star trails. Uh, as you've seen already, they move differently depending on which way you're facing. So again, this is north, this is east, west, and south. So think about this in terms of how the star trails are going to fit your scene. Here, for most of the frame, this is an Olympic um, shot up at Hurricane Ridge. Most of the star trails are coming right into my main subject, which is the silhouette of the trees and then the mountains in the background. So that works pretty well. That's bringing the eye right here. What I don't like is these trails up here, because these aren't bringing the eye anywhere. All right, so I'm thinking about the direction of the star trails and how they help or hinder the composition. This is in Death Valley. So here, I place the North Star over here. And the circles, and I, could, I visualized this in daylight when I visited the scene, when I scouted the scene, the circles are curving right down toward the car. So that's good, I like that. If the circles were going off the frame, it wouldn't work compositionally. So again, think about the direction of the star trails and how that's gonna help or hurt your composition. Also look for shapes, right? So here we kind of had a, kind of a nice rounded shape to the ridge line, and that's why I put the star 
the North Star there and did the star circles here because they mimic the shape of something else in the scene. So again, thinking of the shape of the star trails. Same thing here. Put the star trail right behind the tip of the sea stack. So as the circles come around, it's helping the composition. Uh, this is, I would term this concept, leveling up with star trails. Most people who show star, uh, who shoot star trails, particularly when they first start, they're just doing it. You know, they just point the camera any direction with any subject, and the whole goal is to get the stars moving. And if all you're doing is learning technique, then by all means, go out and do that. Uh, but when you're ready to level up and create better compositions, then think about how the stars are going to work in your composition. So, that said, how do we make star trails? Well, we break the 400 rule. And we break it by a lot. Because uh, remember, we don't want short star trails. We want star trails that are long enough so that it was clear that that's what we were trying to do. Essentially, longer shutter speeds, longer star trails. The longer the camera's open, the longer you're creating that image, the longer those trails are going to be. So this is a 20 second exposure. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park. We're doing a workshop next year. Nice sharp star trails. That's 40 minutes. So 20 seconds, 40 minutes. And now we're starting to get star trails. Remember I said when I'm facing north, 40 minutes is usually my benchmark. That's where I want to start. Uh, one more thing about star circles is how do we make them? So we get this question sometimes. Uh, how do you know where the circles are going to be? Right? And so they're going to be in the north sky. Uh, we've seen that already. But how do you find where the center of that circle is going to be? What we, want, what we need to do is find the north star. Um, I got a funny story about finding the north star. We did a workshop in Death Valley last year, and we had a, a gentleman who flew up from Argentina from, for, uh, it was his 80th birthday. And this is what he did for his birthday as he flew up and came on the workshop with us. And we were teaching about star trails and star circles. Uh, we taught it during the day, and then we were out shooting at night. And he wasn't really getting it. And then we were out shooting the next night, and he still really hadn't gotten it. And he, he came up to me, and he, and he said, could you explain to me again how to do the circles? And I said, well, you've got to find the North Star. And he said, well, where is that? And I said, well, all right, we've got to find the Big Dipper. And he said, what's the Big Dipper? <laughs> and then it occurred to me, he lived his whole life in the Southern Hemisphere. So I didn't know this. So this information is not as obvious to everybody as it seems. Um, so that was fun. I got to show him what the Big Dipper was. And that's what you want to find. So here we're kind of facing north, and here's the Big Dipper. So that's what you want to find, right? That's like the one constellation that everybody knows, right? If you're from the Northern Hemisphere. The two stars in the Big Dipper that are important are these two at the end, kind of like at the end of the cup. So you want to find those two stars, and you want to look at where they point. The next bright star up, that's the North Star. So that's how we find it. And then you take the North Star, and you put it in your composition where you want it. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this case, I wanted it right behind the tip of the sea stack. I saw a great photo from one of our workshop attendees in uh, Joshua Tree, where he put the North Star right behind uh, a windmill. So it was like the windmill with all the circles coming out from the side of it. <coughs> but how do we make star trails in moonlight? So this is another question we get a lot. Um, in fact, I was just at a conference uh, in the Smoky Mountains last week and a conference in Acadia a month ago. Both times we had a full moon, and people said, oh, well, we can't do star trails. Yes, we can. Uh, so, so far what I've covered is kind of star trails 101. Uh, how do you create star trails when the conditions are perfect for them? Uh, and when you can, just leave your camera open for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour or two hours or however long you want. Obviously, you can't do that in moonlight. Uh, because if you leave your shutter open for an hour in moonlight, the scene's just going to blow out. Okay, but we can do star trails. And there, that proves it. So this is an Olympic National Park. 
Um, it's a quarter moon. So there's lots of moonlight. All of this is moonlight. The water's being lit by the moon. It's really pretty, but I was still able to do a star trail photograph. Uh, this involves some post-production work, but it's not hard, and I'm going to walk you through exactly how to do it. Another time this is useful is with uh, light pollution, or if you have a lot of artificial or any kind of ambient light. Uh, this is in Rocky Mountain National Park, um, and it was right near a marina on the west side of the park. And the, the lights from the marina uh, were spreading all over the place. So we had a light pollution situation. That's what's lighting. This isn't me light painting. This whole foreground is being lit by the, lits, by the lights from the marina. But I can still do star trails using this method. Now, if I had tried to do, I want to say this is about a 40 minute star trail, um, maybe 30 minutes. But if I had done a 30 minute exposure, these trees would have just completely blown out. There would have been no information in there at all. Okay, so how did I do this? Star stacking. Okay, so it's more post production, but it solves a problem. So, what is star stacking? It's a post-processing te uh, post technique for shooting star trails that solves some of the image quality issues that are inherent in night photography. Okay, so if you're averse to post-production, that's fine, but I can tell you the two photos that I just showed, I would not have been able to do without post-processing. So here's an example in Death Valley. This is out at the racetrack, the racetrack playa. And I created this using 120 stacked 20 second photos. Why? So why are we star stacking? What's the advantage of star stacking? So one, you're gonna end up with cleaner files with less noise. All right, so if I did that same photo I just showed before, uh, you know, if I did an hour long exposure, I've gotta deal with long exposure noise that's inherent from the camera, from the sensor heating up. I don't get long exposure noise with shorter exposures. It's also easier on the camera battery. Um, a one hour exposure is gonna be harder in your camera battery than 61 minute exposures. That's also easier to compensate for mistakes. And I can show you an example in a little bit. Uh, if I did, actually let me give you a real life example. So Tim Cooper, one of, my, one of my partners, one of the instructors in our program, he did, it was a two or three hour exposure in Arches National Park with star trails and he added light painting and he blew the light painting. He just made a mistake with the light painting and ruined the whole photo. A two or three hour photo he ruined because of one mistake. So instead, if you shoot with a bunch of exposures and you, uh, you, you, you mess up the light painting or a car drives by and messes up the scene, well, you can just get rid of that frame. So it's easier to compensate for mistakes. Also, as I said before, we can shoot star trails in moonlight or in light pollution. It's also easier to add light painting. Um, so uh, again, if I was doing a one hour exposure and I wanted to add some light painting into it, then I'd really need to get it right. Or if I wanted to try three different iterations, now I'm talking about three different one hour exposures. But if, uh, if I'm doing instead the 120 stacked images, then on three of those I could do different light painting and then just use the one that I like. And I'll show you an example of that in a second too. So this is a photo from the edge of the Blue Ridge Parkway where a lot of what I'm talking about comes into play. I wanted to do some star trails. I wanted to add light painting, but I wasn't sure exactly what, so I did a couple different iterations and then used the one I liked. I've got light pollution back here, which would have blown out during a 20 second exposure, a 20 minute exposure, and there's also moonlight. Despite all of that, I was still able to produce a star trail by using star stacking. So here's how we do it. First, we're going to compose and focus, just like normal. We determine our exposure using the 400 rule or 
however you want to determine your exposure. And then you're going to shoot multiple frames. So instead of the one shot, we're shooting a bunch of photos. And then you can add light painting if you want. After that, you process the files. And I'm going to walk through the whole process. And then you stack in post-production. OK, so do we want to do short exposures or do we want to do long exposures? Um, and this is, again, for star stacking, because you can stack however many of images, however many images as you want. Um, if you use short exposures, then you're going to have to shoot a lot of frames. And obviously, if you use long exposures, it's fewer frames. So for example, say you did a bunch of short exposures. A one-hour star trail could be 180 20-second exposures. That's a lot. A long exposure, using long exposures, maybe you do 10 six-minute exposures to produce the same final result. Or there could be six 10-minute exposures. It's whatever you want. Um, and you base that on whatever exposure you determined was correct for the scene. There's also other pros and cons to why you might want to use more shorter exposures or fewer longer exposures. So let's walk through those. If you're using shorter exposures, you're going to have less long exposure noise to deal with. So again, long exposure noise comes from the sensor heating up during a long exposure. So at five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, the warmer it is, temperature has an effect on this. Uh, when it's warm out, it happens sooner. So that sensor is going to heat up, and you're going to get long exposure noise. Shooting shorter exposures, you don't get that. Also, shorter exposures, as I mentioned before, is less drain on the battery. We don't need to use an intervalometer. So we talked earlier about the difference between an intervalometer and a cable release. If you, for most cameras, if you want to shoot more than 30 seconds, you need to use an intervalometer. So that's more to set up. Uh, a lot of people aren't comfortable with an intervalometer. You've got to program it. Uh, if you do shorter exposures, you don't need it. If your exposure is only 20 seconds, all you need is a way to turn the camera on and off. This is probably my favorite advantage of using shorter exposures, is that I can take one frame out of my whole sequence and use it as a start point photo. I could also take all of those frames and create a time lapse. So if I had 180 20 second exposures, I could produce a really beautiful time lapse of the stars, the Milky Way, moving across a scene. I can also easily eliminate prob problem frames. So like I mentioned before, maybe a car drove by, or you know, maybe somebody turned on their flashlight. So it's easier to eliminate one 20 second frame than one 10 minute frame. Right? Because uh, if, I remove, if I have to remove a 10 minute frame, I'm going to get a gap in my star trail now. If I'm removing one 20 second frame, I might still get a gap in the star trail, but you're probably not going to see it unless you're pixel peeping. Everybody knows what pixel peeping is, right? Because we're the only people who do it. <laughs> so uh, I heard somebody say, it was a gallery owner, say that she always knows when somebody visiting the gallery is a photographer because they're the only people who look at photos like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's pixel peeping. Uh, you can also eliminate artifacts without any noticeable gaps in the star trail. So by an artifact, I mean you know, like a, a plane flying through the scene. And you can allow for star stacking when the moon is bright. So again, back to before, it's hard to do a 10, 20 minute exposure with moonlight. 20 second exposure, no problem. OK, so what about long exposures? So that's a lot of good advantages for using short exposures, but there are advantages for using long ones, too. The one, you can use a lower ISO. So this is better image quality, of course. So I mentioned before about um, the advantage of using shorter exposures is we don't have as much high ISO noise to deal with. Uh, I'm sorry, as much long exposure noise to deal with. But we do ha have high ISO noise with shorter exposures. With a longer exposure, being able to shoot at, say, ISO 400, now you don't have high ISO noise to deal with. So less high ISO noise. 
You also end, end up with a smaller file size when you stack all those photos. So again, I'm gonna walk through the process in a few minutes, but essentially, all these photos that you're shooting, we're gonna stack together as layers in Photoshop. If you have 10 layers versus 180, then that final file size of the 10 layers is gonna be a lot smaller. So that's a lot easier to work with. It's um, less space that you need to store it on your hard drive. It's less taxing on the system and opens a lot faster. It also is gonna take less time to stack those raw files. So if you're only using 10, that takes less time for Photoshop to stack those, to open those all up and stack them than if it was doing it with 100 photos. There's also fewer layers to edit out artifacts. So I mentioned before, maybe a plane flies through the scene and you, and you wanna get rid of that. If that plane shows up, say if you're shooting longer exposures, that plane might show up only on one layer. So that's pretty easy to get rid of. If it shows up on 20 layers, now you have to go through 20 layers to get rid of it. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, in this example, this is from Joshua Tree, obviously. Uh, and I'm gonna walk through exactly how I cr used this scene to create a star stack. So I found a tree, I like the shape, I like the direction it faced, I like the composition, was able to kind of put it between these rocks, and I determined my exposure. Next, I planned with light painting. So I wanna figure out my light painting strategy before I start. And then, I shot it all, okay? So I got my composition, just like we talked earlier, I focused, I figured out my light painting, and then I shot a bunch of frames. So next is when I get home, this is what it looks like in Lightroom. So you can see exactly what I did here. This is where I started. <clears throat> So I adjusted the composition a little bit, straightened it out. Okay, now it looked pretty good. That light painting was way too bright. And dial it down a little bit. Eh, still working on it. Oh, now I got me in the scene. We'll talk about that in the next presentation about keeping yourself out of the photo when you're light painting. Okay, here. And now I'm starting to like how it looks. Eh, a little less. Okay. So. Here is where my stack starts. So you can see I did 70 photos. Uh, when you have these in Lightroom, I recommend using a Lightroom stack, which is different than star stacking, and putting them all in a stack this way, see if I close this, it only takes up one thumbnail. You know, otherwise you could have 70, 100, 200 photos that look exactly the same as you're scrolling through Lightroom. So put, put them all in a stack just to make it easier to deal with. But we'll open up the stack here. So again, these are all, if we go through, there's where I added my light painting here. This is where a car came through. There was a road was about an eighth of a mile away and a car came by and got some light on the rocks. So I can decide later if I want to get rid of that or not. I'll watch the stars. So you can see them moving through the scene. Oh, and there goes a plane. And there are the stars. So I'm just scrolling through all my photos here. And you saw a couple spots where a car came by again. There's lots of planes. Palm Springs is nearby. And that's my 70 photos. So how do I use those 70 photos to create a star stack? First of all, you select them all. Select all of the photos that you're using for your star stack in Lightroom. And from here, we're going to bring them into Photoshop. So you're going to go to Photo, Edit In, Open as Layers in Photoshop except I didn't mean to actually do it because it takes a really long time. So, photo, edit in, open as layers in Photoshop. So this is gonna take every photo that's selected and bring it into Photoshop into one file with each raw file opened as its own layer. Now this takes a while with a high-res image, with high-res images. So I did it for us ahead of time. I mean, seriously, if you're doing like 100, 200 photos, you could literally go make, it, make yourself a sandwich and a cup of coffee and, uh, and wait for the computer to do its work. But this is what you end up with. So now we're in Photoshop, and here, as you can see, we've got 
70 layers. Each photo is its own layer. Select them all. So I just did a shift click. Now here's where the magic happens. That's really complex. You ready? Everybody focused? So you come right here. This is where the blend mode is, this drop down. You want to change the blend mode of the layers to lighten. Now what the light and blend uh, what the light and blend mode does is it goes layer by layer and looks at each pixel and brings the brightest one forward. So think about a star moving through the frame, moving across a black sky. So every time that star moves, now the blend mode, the light and blend mode is moving that star forward. Each time it moves, it's moving it forward, and that's how it creates the trail. Okay, you ready? Here's the magic. Watch how complex this is. Boom, that's it. That's it. It's really easy. It's just a matter of changing that blend mode to lighten. So again, selecting all the layers, change the blend mode to lighten. So you'll see what also happened is all those layers where a car drove by and light painted for me, those all show up too. Because again, anything that's light is going to come forward. So I could go and get rid of any of this, but I actually kind of liked it. I think the cars did me a favor. They were driving at the perfect angle to get me some side light and lit up the rocks here. So let's leave it alone. Let's let uh, serendipity be my friend. At this point, you have a decision to make, because this is going to be a pretty big file. As you can see right here, this one's, I mean, this is only 200 and something megs with the, with the lower res JPEGs. Um, if these were the full res files, this is going to be huge. So do we save it or not? That's the question. Do we want to save this giant stacked file? Right? With 70, probably not. If it was 10 layers, then sure, I can, I can save that. 70, 100, 200, I think the highest I've done is 180. That's a lot. That's a, just a gigantic file. In fact, it's so big, you can't even save it as a PSD. You have to use Photoshop's large, uh, large file, uh, the, the file format, it's the PS, what's, what is it? B, right, so uh, that's how big it is. It takes forever to save it, and it takes forever to open it up again. So from here, do you, do you save it or not? Um, one way that you can kind of get around this is say I don't want to save set a file with 70 layers, but I do want to be able to work on the layers again. Maybe I don't want, you know, I could just flatten it. You know, I could, um, so flatten the image. And then I've done this, I can save. That's easy. But then I can't work on it again, right? There's an advantage to having layers. So one thing I could do is I could say, you know, take 10 of these at a time and put them in a group. And I'm not counting these out, I'm just ballparking. So all you have to do is just shift click them and drive them, uh, drag them right here. Let's just, just to expedite the matter. So I could create these different groups, and now for each of these groups, I can merge that group, and then that gives me a layer of just those. So now I could actually just make five layers and save that. So I could do all my work, and then combine the layers, and then still it's kind of a, a middle ground. I have a layered file that I can save that makes it a, a little easier to edit in the future, but I don't have to save that giant file. So once I'm done, all I have to do is close this, save it, and then it'll go back to Lightroom as the final image. And that's the final photo. So a couple of things I did to clean up here. Uh, I wasn't really crazy. This is something I look for. Is there, a, is there a star trail that's distracting? You know, is it toward the edge or is it brighter than all the other ones? And this one is. So this one I found to be pretty bright and I thought it was a distraction. So I just got rid of it. 
it's really easy to clone that out. Okay, so a few tips about doing this. Um, one is you want to turn off your long exposure noise reduction. So this is key. Uh, long exposure noise reduction, like, like I said before, it, um, as the sensor heats up, noise builds up. And long exposure noise reduction shoots a blank frame to find out where that noise is showing up. And then it subtracts it from the image. So if you do a five minute exposure, then the camera is going to spend the next five minutes shooting a blank frame so I can do the noise reduction. So what just happened? Now you've got a five minute gap in your star trail. So turn off long exposure noise reduction and just deal with the noise in post production. Set it and forget it. Once you get your camera set up and you're shooting your sequence of star photos to do your star stacking, just walk away. Let the camera do its thing. You don't want to bump into it. Um, that's the big thing. You don't want to bump your camera in the middle of it. This is also a great use for a second camera because you might be dedicating, you know, whether you're doing star stacking or a long exposure star trail, uh, your camera is going to be busy for 20 minutes, an hour, two hours. So what are you going to do? You, know, you could stand around and, and enjoy the scenery. That's fine. I'm not against that. Or you can have a second setup with you and go do some other work, uh, go somewhere else and shoot some star points or do some light painting. Also, make sure that your stars are sharp before you start the star trail. Uh, it can be easy to think that because the stars are moving and essentially kind of blurring, that it's not important that they're sharp, but they are. Uh, it is important because you want to make sure that the star trails are sharp. If you have blurry stars, then your trails are going to be blurry too. Like I said, do not bump your tripod because you'll end up with star trails that look like this. They won't be lined up right. Uh, it, it not even, so this was interesting, when we were shooting in, uh, when we had our workshop at Olympic in September, Matt was shooting uh, some star trails and he, he, put his, uh, he put his tripod down in the sand on the beach, made sure it was nice and stable, and he came back later and found broken star trails. So somebody had bumped his tripod. Said, ah. All right, so he started another exposure and he came back. Same thing happened. I was like, what's going on? It's the sand. As the water came in, a high wave came up and it shifted the sand and the, the tripod just enough. It only had to move a little bit. Do not lose your tripod. <laughs> so if you set up your tripod to do a one hour star trail and you go off to do something else, then you know, make sure you have a way to find it. Uh, somebody on a recent workshop had an ingenious solution. I had never thought about this, but they took glow tape and wrapped it around the tripod leg. And you could see that tripod. Not only did he lose it, but it was really easy to see in the dark and not bump into it. Uh, something that I like to do, I showed you this photo before. This is out on the racetrack playa in Death Valley. Um, we had set up the cameras. Uh, I was shooting with my friend Steve last February. It was really cold out. Uh, once the sun set, our cameras were about a half mile out into the playa, and it was too cold to just stand around waiting for them. So we decided to walk back to the car and sit in the car while the cameras were doing their thing. Um, I have, uh, I have a, a, a geo tracker that I use so that I can match up GPS data to my photos. And the geo tracker has a little blinking LED on it. So what I do so I don't lose my tripod is I'll just hang that off the bottom. Right? So I don't have a center post, but I do have a little hook. And I hang that off the bottom. As I'm walking around, I can see the LED flashing. I know exactly where my tripod is. So in this case, we're half a mile away from the tripods, right? So back at the car. And I figured, OK, that's enough so that when we walk back out, I know the general direction to walk out into the dark playa. Then when we get out there, I'll, eventually I'll see it, and then we'll go see it. Well, it turns out Death Valley is so dark. Now this is 30 miles off the you know more populated parts of the park. It's really dark out there, so dark under a new moon. I could see that little LED flashing from the car a half mile away. I could just make it out in the dark. I was like, that can't be it. And then it was. Yes. What is the time period between frames? 
There's no time period between frames. Boom. So that is a good question. Yes, you want the frames to go boom, 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 boom. Any uh, break between that, if you were to have a 10 second interval, then you're gonna have a gap in the star trail. Uh, something else to watch out for, another tip. Uh, this is in Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio, uh, where we did a workshop last spring. So I set up this photo, so I'm doing the star stacking because uh, I wanted to demo it and just set up the shot and I walked away to work with the attendees. I came back later and I found out that something had happened. That can happen when you're doing log exposures. There we go. Condensation. Yeah, so condensation on the lens. It's just the, uh, uh, the weather conditions were just perfect. So this is something you gotta watch out for. The weather conditions were perfect for condensation. I didn't even think about it. I had walked away and I came back and my, most of my star stack was ruined. Now I did show you a final photo before, a 20 minute star stack. So again, that's one of the advantages of doing star stacks. If I had done an hour exposure, the whole thing would have been ruined. But I was able to take that 20 minutes of star stacks and still produce a workable photo. Uh, so a few tips on avoiding condensation. Uh, it's this, my camera was pointed up, which makes it easier for condensation to form on the lens. I didn't have a lens hood on. Have, using a lens hood will slow down the process a little bit. Uh, also, this lens was the 14 to 24, which is, has a bulbous front element. Condensation forms quicker on that. Uh, so if you're in a situation where you might get condensation, uh, something you can do is take those hand warmers, those, you know, those ones that you shake and you put them in your gloves or in your pocket, and you put them on the lens. So you could just wrap them with a rubber band, which is usually enough to keep enough heat on the lens so that condensation won't form. Uh, but even better is to cover it up with something. Uh, so uh, Lance, one of the other instructors, what he does is he takes those uh, can cozies, you know, like a beer cozy, the, the foam that you put a can in and keep it cold, and he slices it, and then he wraps that around the lens with the hand warmer in it. There's also somebody who actually makes a product designed just for this. So uh, you put the hand warmers in, and it wraps around the lens with Velcro, I think. Uh, but again, you're just keeping your lens warm so that the condensation doesn't form. Uh, this was a big, va uh, big deal when we were out in Olympic as well, working on the coast. As it got cooler, and uh, there might have been mist rolling in a couple nights, the lenses were fogging up a lot uh, to the point where uh, we, we came close to buying out the local hardware store of their hand warmers. Uh, so some more advanced options too. You can combine star stacking with focus stacking. You're stacking anyway. So you can use your stacking and your multiple frames to accomplish other things at the same time. Uh, so focus stacking is, you know, uh, when if you have shallow depth of field, but you want your foreground and your background and your middle ground to be in focus, uh, you can take multiple frames with different points in focus and then layer those together in post-production so that everything is sharp. So this comes into play a lot when you're shooting at night. Like I said, we're shooting at f2.8, you know, maybe f1.4. You have very little depth of field. Uh, so if you're stacking anyway, then maybe consider doing some star stacking at the same time. You could also do ISO stacking. So what do I mean by this? So if I'm shooting the night sky, as we've talked about, oftentimes we're using a high ISO, which has inherent issues with noise. Um, but I could shoot my foreground at a different ISO. If I'm stacking anyway, why not? So here's that photo from Death Valley again. So here for the foreground, this is a different image than the ones from up here. I focused on the ground. So now I've got focus here and focus up here. I shot the foreground at 15 seconds at F8, nice step to field at ISO 800. Hardly any noise at all. For the stars, now I'm focusing on the stars. I'm shooting at 20 seconds, but at ISO 6400. And then when I did the star stack in post-production, I just added in this frame as my foreground. 
So a few software options for the star stacking as well that can help you out. Uh, one is Stackomatic. Um, and what this does is it automates the process. And this is a script that you install in, uh, in Photoshop that automates that whole process of opening each image as a layer and adds a mask to it. So if you wanted to mask out artifacts, and it creates a PSD file. So everything we did before, it does automatically. And you can save that final photo, uh, that final file as a PSD. Uh, and that's as opposed to the next software option I'm going to show you. So Stackomatic, uh, you can go to Lance's website. He's one of the official hosts of this. Um, and you can download it there at thenightsky.com. That's sky with an E slash downloads. And uh, the last version of Stackomatic, he's not uh, the guy who created it. It's not, um, uh, not still working on it. So Lance is one of the people hosting it for him. So another option is Star Stacks. Um, and it does something uh, kind of interesting. It eliminates the gaps in star trails. If you're doing star stacking like we were talking about, one problem, and again, this is something only pixel peepers are going to see, the one problem that comes up is that there will be tiny gaps in the edge of the trail. Uh, so I, sh I showed you this photo before from Capitol Reef. If I zoom in, you see how they're kind of dotted? Now, this isn't because of uh, any time between the frames. I mean, the frames were shot one after the other. This is because of the way the pixels are created. I mean, pixels are kind of round. They're not square. So if you picture, you know, two round pixels, they don't line up perfectly. There's like the rounded edges in between. So you get these tiny little gaps. Star stacks will fix that. Star stacks will go in and fill in those gaps and create a really nice line. Now, again, you're not going to see this unless you're pixel peeping. But if you wanted to make a really large print, then maybe star stacks is something you would want to do as uh, the, the final part of your process. So the reason I say the final part of the process is because you can only save it in JPEG. So if you use star stacks, once you're done with it, it creates a JPEG file that's harder to edit without introducing artifacts. Because again, JPEG is a lossy compression. It's a lossy file format. So if you're interested in star stacks, you can get it at this very catchy and easy to remember web, uh, URL. <clears throat> and there we go. So that's how we shoot stars.